good for now. Hydration and caffeine goes by. Over here in that hangout. Okay. I just posted. All right. So it should show up on that page. Hey um, Joe. Hey Reed. And I'll do the Twitter. Yeah. If you'll just. How's it going? Yeah. It's on How are y'all doing? So if you'll grab it, put it on Buffer. Good. Pretty good. Can y'all hear me? Okay. I can. Yes. I can. Yes. Hey Mike, let me know if this disturbed you. Oh, okay. All right, we'll, we'll just hang out and wait for a few folks to, other folks to grab us. I know Eric's joining us. Uh, speaking of, hey, Eric. Hey, Bonner, how's it going? Doing well. How are you doing? Good. I'm trying this from my iPad, see if this works. Oh, <laughs> nice. So, thanks for joining us. This is your first Google Hangout, huh? Yeah. Nice. Isn't it, it, it's amazing, isn't it? This is interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, we've got a few more people joining us. We'll just uh, wait for a few more minutes. Okay. By the way, Jennifer is going to monitor in this, but she's got some other stuff she's got going on this morning. So, okay, you're in spirit. Okay, I'm sure she is. Oh, is Jeff joining? I'm sure if he was. Huh? Okay. All right, your tweet just came out, Bonner. With the URL to the hangout, that looks good. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Reed. <laughs> the internet works. Very right, cool. Okay. Well, I think uh, there's going to be some other folks joining us, and we're also recording this. So y'all are aware. Y'all probably seen the other YouTube videos that we have put out there, and just to open up. The purpose of these discussions are to try and uh, identify issues and uh, talk about ways that issues might be addressed, ways that initiatives might be moved forward, and ideally to try and form uh, communities that can help to implement those efforts. <laughs> the example that I always use is City Camp and how City Camp was a uh, began as a discussion about what it looked like at the intersection of government and technology and that ended up growing into a group that then implemented some specific deliverables that helped the city of Raleigh move the ball forward from a government tech perspective. So if there's opportunities for the city or for us to identify some ways that we could help uh, make the city a better place for biking and pedestrian issues. That's the ideal. So please, just keep a, keep mindful of that. That uh, we would we're trying to identify those specific things that we can maybe do that would help. And whether it's a cultural shift, a specific uh, action, a um, way to establish dialogue. Hey Scott, how you doing? Um, we're just, I'm just doing a quick introduction that you've heard before actually. Uh, we want to identify those things and try and, and see if we can, we can help out. I know Eric and Jennifer do an amazing job and whatever citizens can do to support their efforts and help them to uh, enhance 
biking and pedestrian issues in Raleigh. I know that they appreciate it, and uh, it certainly helps from my perspective from the council table to be able to hear from constituents and to have an engaged uh, bike pad community that continually reaches out to the council and lets them know that these issues are important. So just please keep that in mind uh, the, of what we're trying to identify and uh, I guess we can we can go from there. Eric, thanks so much for, for joining us. Do you want to give a quick little thumbnail sketch history of uh, the past few years advancement in bicycle pedestrian issues and how the city has has changed over the past five ten years with in that respect well um, just very briefly um, you know we completed and adopted our first comprehensive bicycle plan in 2009 and um, uh, that really laid the groundwork for us to be able to um, have a framework for implementing a lot of different improvements um, and we've done a lot not just with infrastructure but also with um, policy and programming um, and trying to realize that it's, it's not just it's not just bike lanes I mean that's, that's gross oversimplification uh, there's a lot of elements as far as supportive infrastructure uh, there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle uh, with respect to development code um, and then uh, culture, I think, is actually a really important part. So we're sort of attacking this on, on multiple fronts now for the last several years, and I think we're really starting to make some headway. Um, we were very fortunate. Um, last year we were designated as a bike-friendly city um, at the bronze level. And so um, we've, we've laid enough groundwork on, on these multiple fronts to get some attention. And um, so our, our next step is to try and continue to push that forward uh, and achieve silver level status. Um, so we've got a goal to, to move towards um, the new unified development ordinance that goes into effect next week. Um, has some significant changes as it relates to bicycle infrastructure, uh, not just for public streets, but also for the private realm, uh, introducing for the first time that we will have um, bike parking requirements. Uh, we had some, some very limited bike parking requirements in the old code. Uh, now we have uniform bike parking requirements for virtually every type of use. So you're going to see a lot more bike racks uh, being installed and some provisions for not just external bike racks but for long-term storage as well for commuters. Um, so that's sort of the landscape that we're operating under at, at this point. I'm, I'm really happy that we've moved the ball forward um, in, in many different ways and we've got a lot more to go. Our, big, our next big push um, is on an infrastructure basis. Um, we've got a, a project that right now is in development um, actually, it's in design and under contract to uh, add. Um, we have a target of a minimum of about 30 miles worth of bike facilities. Um, the bike plan that we did, that was approved called for over 300 miles of uh, new bike lanes and another you know, 75 miles of other types of markings uh, throughout the city. Um, so this is our first big project to really uh, uh, step into that arena on multiple roads. And then um, we've been working a lot with NTDOT on the Watch For Me campaign. And uh, Jennifer gets a lot of credit for the work she's put into that and uh, realizing that the public outreach and, and community awareness is a big part of this. So uh, that program launched as a pilot uh, a little while back and was a little more pedestrian oriented and now it's being expanded to include bicycles and uh, increasing awareness for drivers and increasing uh, awareness for cyclists as well. So we're really excited about that. Yeah, well, it's been fun to see all the new infrastructure being built out and the culture changing, the uh, first Friday bike rides, the mm -hmm. different biking groups that have come up to promote community amongst cyclists has been, seems like, seems like to me that has been contemporaneous, that growth has been contemporaneous with our infrastructure growth and that things are moving in the right direction that in terms of getting people, more people onto their feet and bikes for travel uh, because it's clearly in our all, in all of our long-term best interests to get people off roads and into alternate modes of transit to alleviate parking issues, and, or sorry, to alleviate traffic issues 
and parking issues, and uh, to promote healthy lifestyles, uh, promote clean air. Uh, there's so many benefits of encouraging cycling and and pedestrian activity that it, uh, it it's fun to see that, that things are moving there from a, a on the ground standpoint, physical infrastructure, and with that cultural infrastructure that's required to sustain any momentum over time. Uh, I know that the folks who are on this call are mostly proponents of cycling, uh, cyclists at cycling facilities and, and encouraging uh, as many different opportunities to, to ride and walk as possible. Eric, what are, what are some of the elements that experience pushback for, from uh, implementation of bike ped infrastructure, events, culture, otherwise? What are, what are the impediments to our uh, growth from a bike ped perspective? Hmm. Um. I can, I can oversimplify it in a couple ways. Uh, one is to talk about infrastructure specifically and how do we how do we retrofit the built environment. Um, you know, we're a city of, what, 140 square miles, I think, thereabouts. Um, yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're a pretty large city in terms of a physical footprint, and yet there's a lot of places throughout the city that have a, a wide variety of, um, of growth-related infrastructure needs. So, um, as we do projects and as we make improvements, um, uh, Eric. Yes, sir. Eric, we lost you. Just, we lost you for a quick second there. Okay. Did you? Uh, can you go back? Uh, hmm. Uh, I, I can. I can actually hear him actually, fine. Actually, Bonner, Bonner you, we're losing you. <laughs> yeah. It's, oh. It's, it's the North sorry. Hills connection. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's. Uh, we're. My, my Ethernet is not working on okay. my MacBook. Yeah, yeah, I have. Or a switch. I thought these things. The, this is my first MacBook, and my expectation was that it would never have any issues, and that I would always be uh, happy. That it would make me happy for the rest of my life, and that uh, that worked out for me. Um, all right, Nathan's got. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. All right. So there's a lot of background noise there. You, you need you need to oh. mute your line. Yeah, your mic. Yep. Now there's some static. There it goes. Much better. All right, now. Nope. All right. I, I like the way that I'm basked in sort of a gentle amber glow in this on this demo too. So, all right. Sorry, Eric. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, but in terms of challenges, sort of the sheer volume of retrofitting uh, the city, and um, so that's um, that's the first thing. And so, part of what the bike plan gave us the the wherewithal to do is to prioritize. You know, where were the areas that were the greatest opportunities for improving cycling? Um, uh, where was our biggest need? And so that's um, that's given us a framework under which to operate. And then as we do new projects, and you know, as we're as we're doing street improvement projects, um, whether we're um, building new streets or, or you know improving existing streets or even basics like resurfacing. Um, we're going back and incorporating um, both bike and pet improvements into the projects as we go. So that's a that's a nice. I, don't, I hate to call it slow and steady, but it's a steady way to to do this in an orderly fashion and, and address all of our needs. It's going to take us some time, though. I mean, you know, I always remind people Rome wasn't built in a day, and 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 neither was the city of Raleigh. You know, it's a it's a city that's taken you know, 200 years to get to this point, and um, at the same time, we want to continue to to be aggressive. And try and do as much as we can, and um, so so that's the, there's the physical aspect of how much. Um, there is a cultural aspect on many fronts. Um, some of it is you know um, driver behavior and understanding what share the road really means. 
Um, and that's what a campaign like Watch For Me is meant to help address uh, to get us to where um, people are a lot more thoughtful. And you, know, you see this in different parts of the country. I know a lot of people will say, well, you know, if you're in the Pacific Northwest and somebody steps up to a crosswalk, you know, all the traffic comes to halt. Um, I think it's safe to say that's not our culture here, uh, right or wrong. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis on trying to uh, improve how drivers react and raise that awareness. One of the things that came out of the research for the Watch For Me and C campaign and working with folks like the Highway Safety Research Center was um, the fact that the um, they said, you know, this is not the type of campaign you can do for six months. It's It's got to be sustained for several years in order to be able to, to burn into the public consciousness. Um, couple that with sort of what I call our immigrant culture, and, and I mean that by a number of people that continue to move to this area, and you, you have to continue to sort of re-educate on a continual basis for everyone that's uh, moving here. So those are, those are a couple of our big challenges. Uh, thanks, Eric. So, so what, what the, I guess I'll open up, go read, Scott, what do you all see as the successes that you all have witnessed in the city of Raleigh, and what are the areas where we could be improving? And hey, Mike, welcome to the conversation. Joe, Scott, Reed, or, or Mike, what do you all yeah, see as I, the... I, I, yeah, I'll jump in here. So, I mean, I think yeah. I'm going to put you on mute, monitors a little bit of a uh, feedback. So just unmute yourself when you want to respond. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think from a from a from a dad, uh, a family member growing up, or a, you know, a parent growing up in uh, Raleigh, the Greenways have been a, a huge joy, a huge a huge avenue to get out there and um, you know for simple recreation. I mean, we definitely have enjoyed the, the long news. New screenway already at this point, and the many different greenways that feed out of downtown Raleigh, where I happen to live. Um, you know, I think you know the thing that I would look. I'm going to jump real quick to like a possible um, avenue of improvement would be. I like to see the greenways become an avenue for commuters, commuters getting to work specifically. Um, and what would that take? Like, you know, a couple things to come to mind is that obviously. Sun goes down uh, later part of this year after five o'clock when people need to commute, and, and technically you're not supposed to be on the greenways. You've got some greenways that have gates that actually close um, when the sun goes down, and so kind of prohibits you from from using it as a commuter lane. And of course, it's probably not the safest thing to be biking out in pitch black. Um, and then also, you know, could we get greenways out uh, to to areas of where large corporations are? So I'll kind of leave it there. But the, my two points were is that we're having a great time leveraging the greenways we have today. I feel like it definitely is a blessing. My second point is is how can we use it more for commuting? Thanks. Well, it's funny that you bring that up too. Um, I saw Eric the other day when we had the first time where the uh, the greenway group got together with the bicycle pedestrian group. So the, the citizen boards for those two groups are starting to get together and talk a little bit too. But one of the things that was mentioned that we might <laughs> Um, kind of counter a little bit is that Parks and Rec has been real clear that the primary use of greenways has been for like enjoyment, like getting out, getting some exercise, and have kind of backplayed a little bit on the idea of using it for um, getting to work. Let me point out for a second uh, a couple people that are on the, the hangout here today. Uh, uh, Scott is a member of the city's Parks Rec and um, Greenway Advisory Board and was part of that meeting the other day. And then we also have Mike Dayton that has joined us here. Hey, Mike. And uh, Mike is a member of our um, uh, Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Commission. So um, they met together for the first time uh, last week and talked about these kind of common issues and that notion of um, recreational versus commuter overlap um, was a, a big theme. Um, so I think that as I, I like to tease my friends in Parks and Recreation, you keep building more greenways, and the more connections you make, the more of a transportation system that it becomes. And, and the response is, well, hey, does that mean you can give us some more money? Um, <laughs> so, um, but it's true, and I think as we, as we determine uh, what are these kind of strategic links for commuting, um, that really starts to identify what our, our next steps are, where we need to focus. 
can read one of the things specifically that's been going on recently that hopefully will help to kind of bring attention to cycling in the area is this idea of the um, Heart to the Heart Trail. Um, it's basically like a greenway slash on-road bicycle corridor that starts out at the museum and then works its way back to downtown to the convention bureau. Or the, yeah, the convention bureau, or convention center. And so um, if you think about the route for that, there's a lot of excellent stops along the way. It goes past NC State. It goes past, um, you can take a spur off the cam. There's a lot of opportunities to um, get people excited about cycling that route and all the places that they can go along the way and hopefully educate people that don't consider themselves cyclists and get them interested in that kind of thing. Good point. Okay, so Scott, um, are you, the, the museum to the convention center, is that an established route that you're referring to or one that was discussed last week? I'm watching your audio a little bit, but but basically right now it's a concept. The route exists, but you kind of have to piece it together yourself. And the concept is that eventually it would become something with signage that would help you wayfind along the route. Um, and there's a lot of other um, things that feed into that right now to make that happen that are still kind of in early stages. So, um, it's definitely an idea that has some traction within long. And I think GPAC is really kind of heading up to effort on that right now, too. So I don't, Mike might have something to say or Eric. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that, that's, um, I think that goes to you know, things that I'm interested in with uh, after seeing recently, um, there's a bicycling magazine that runs Raleigh, one of the most, one of the best public art cycling tours in the world. Uh, so, and that jumped, that, that made me realize that we really do have something special here, that, that uh, national bicycling magazines recognize the Art Museum Greenway as one of the top public art viewing locations in, in the world on a, on a bike. And I think we've got an incredible opportunity to begin to go back, as we're, as we're building out our greenway, also go back to areas that have long been established and make those pearls along the greenway stretch. And uh, that then brings not just the recreation component and the community component, but adds an additional cultural component, experiential component, tour, brings tourism, uh, gives people who are coming to Raleigh for uh, various purposes, something additional, an additional reason to come here. So I think what we've got is so fantastic that uh, I'd love to see what is next for our way to be able to make it more than just a commuting opportunity and a recreational opportunity. Uh, but to get back to that, the, the commuting piece, we, our greenway is closed at night. There are certain sections that have a little bit of lighting. Uh, what have people, have anybody, particularly Eric, seen greenways throughout the country that have successfully implemented a 24-hour schedule? And what does that take? I'm trying to think of ones. I know that there's, um, I want to say at least one in Chapel Hill that's got lighting along it. Um, you know, there's a couple different aspects of, of greenways, and I, I want to qualify my comments and say that most of what I do focuses on streets, and, and, and our Parks and Recreation staff is pretty much responsible for the greenways. But uh, I've been known to be a user, so, um, uh, but most of what I've seen um, involves uh, lighting. And sort of I mean, security issues because some sections of the greenway can be pretty isolated, um, and, and that's a challenge. So um, uh, the accessibility issues that um, uh, I believe Ruth mentioned before, you know, talking about the, um, the the section through Meredith College with the Rudy Creek Greenway has been an issue, and we're looking for ways to improve on that. In fact, with the most recent work we did on the House Creek Greenway, we got around uh, that connection and now have a new connection to uh, Ridge Road. 
and that dovetails with the um, improvements that we made along Ridge Road recently. So, um, but I'd love to hear others' comments about um, uh, elements of, of you know quote commuter greenways, et cetera, that um, what are those elements that contribute to that kind of positive environment? Yeah, I've been on the greenways a couple of times in the last two or three weeks in the morning. I've gotten up with some friends to do some rides before work. And I can tell you people right now in the morning are commuting on them. Mm -hmm. So it's happening uh, whether we want it or whether we have a policy about it or not. Now, I don't know what happens in the evening, but I see people going into work in the morning on them. Yeah, and I think uh, that that is going to be something that, from an educational perspective, that we'll probably need to get ahead of. Uh, I know that a lot of times recreational users are expecting a different pace than commuters or maybe other certain other recreational users. And I've, I've always you know, used my bell on the greenway to let people know I'm coming up behind them. And it surprises me how often I get a, a thank you. And I think that is derived from the experiences that people have of getting frightened pretty severely by a cyclist coming flying past them uh, without their being aware of it. So uh, I think, I, hope, I, I assume, I would hope that the discussions between the, the Parks Recreation Advisory Board and the BPAC involve some of those education and cultural um, cultural elements that we need to address. Could, could y'all address, could y'all speak to that at all well, last week? You know, this one of the things that's happened not too long ago is that the Cultural Resources Department is now part of Parks and Rec, so that helps bring some of that closer together as well. So um, things that highlight public art are already kind of um, near to the idea of greenways and parks. Uh, is there, is there a, a, I know that the Greenway is closed down, I've, I must confess, I've broken that rule and used them at night and with a headlamp, it just generally feels pretty safe. Uh, the, uh, also, um, there's, it, it's, but I, I guess there's other issues that, that come into play. Eric. Can you, can you address sort of the, the concerns about nighttime greenway use? It, it's mostly, I'm assuming it's a city liability issue. Um, I, I, can't, I can't address liability. Just in terms of just sort of the, the general issues, you know, one of the things that is um, a, a strong characteristic of our greenway system is that it's typically connected to um, our, our streams and creeks and rivers. You know, that's that's part of our strategy with the Greenway is pairing them with these natural facilities and the Greenway in and of itself creates these natural buffers. Um, and so one of the strengths of that type of system is the advantages for wildlife. Um, so now as you as you go into the evening hours, you obviously got different types of nocturnal wildlife that, that need those areas um, for a variety of reasons. Um, um, but you know, I mean, uh, be candid, we, um, well, I, I live up um, the Upper News Trail, and uh, there was a bear sighting uh, a couple months ago uh, up in Wakefield, and um, we were told by some of us back when we were doing some of the falls and news planning a few years ago that, you know, bears from time to time do move up and down the News River. Um, so, uh, of course, the other the other predator that we've got in this area now is pretty widespread is coyotes. Um, so... That's the kind of thing that if you're on a trail at night, you're both in an isolated situation and you've got limited um, visibility. So, um, God forbid you, you, you come up on one of those situations, but that's one of the, the risks involved with going out there at night. I can, uh, I can speak directly to my experience. Uh, I was on, I had to, I jumped on the greenway to make a short little, a shortcut. It was nighttime. I didn't have a headlight lamp. I was going along, uh, able to see the the pathway just immediately in front of me. 
and I got a, a dog attacked me. And I was able to jump off and keep the bike between me and the dog, and eventually yeah. the owner came running up screaming, and the dog turned around and went away. But it was, uh, I, I can say my heart was going pretty quickly. In pitch black, getting attacked by a dog in the greenway, just nothing to defend myself or even see the dog. I couldn't yeah. even see the dog. I just could hear the dog and kept the bike where between me and what I was hearing. So I, I can, I know that it is a potential safety issue for folks, and I'm by no means encouraging people to use the greenway at night. Uh, but it does seem like, from a commuter use perspective, that is going to be a some, an issue that will continue to come up, and mm -hmm. I know that it's being addressed, and something that y'all are looking at. Maybe, maybe that I think that'll be a, probably a conversation at our next bond package. Would that be accurate, Eric? Uh, not in the um, not in the bond referendum that's slated for October eighth, yeah. the transportation bond. Um, but I think that this this conversation is probably going to evolve as Parks and Recreation looks to the next Parks bond, uh, which may be I, I think I've heard as early as next year. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the discussion, that, and that's the bond I was referring to, the next parks bond. Uh, can, can you speak to any, to Reed's other point about the gates? I know that there's a gates at Meredith. Uh, there's, uh, I think, gates over at State. Are there... You know, I can't. I was trying to think about um, everybody about Poland. I thought there were some gates, but that's to get into Poland, actually, is what I'm thinking of. So, so there, there's a. So, do we have other gates besides at Meredith? Uh, none that I know of. Other folks may speak up. Uh, Scott might know. Um, but Meredith is the one, the one spot that we had an arrangement with Meredith College when the Reedy Creek Greenway was built, uh, recognizing that, um, you know, we were putting a public facility through a, a woman's college. Um, and at the time, the hours of Greenway operation um, were consistent with the hours of um, the public access to Meredith College's campus, sun up to sundown. So um, that was part of the trade-off we made, uh, putting the pathway through the campus there, that they had the license to be able to, to gate it off at night. So that's the only place that I can think of uh, others may know if there's somewhere else on the system that's got that kind of limitation too. Our greenways, um, you know, they're not like public right of way like streets. They're typically easements across private property in some cases. So um, um, obviously, with public access, we can negotiate certain things. But in the case of Meredith College, we had some limitations on that. Okay. Uh, is the one. Um, Additional thing that I hear about fairly often is bike sharing in Raleigh. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that probably all of y'all have had conversations about this. As I understand it, the there's been a city RFP issued. The, there's been responses, but none of the respondents have run with anything for actual implementation. Eric, is that accurate, and is there any updates on that? Um, well, we we put out a request for proposals um, a few weeks ago for um, a bike share system, and um, uh, I think I'm going to assume most people on the on the call are familiar with bike sharing as a technology and the kiosks and parking involved. Um, something that the city's had an interest in for a little while. Uh, we set the the funding up through this year's budget approvals, and um, so we we initiated the RFP process. And Jennifer Baldwin uh, will be overseeing that for us. Uh, we did receive proposals. We have completed our evaluation of those, uh, have been checking reference on the firms, and are moving forward to selection. So um, the, the firms that are, are, are part of the selection process uh, are qualified. Um, they have experience with bike share in other cities, um, which is certainly an evaluation criteria for us as we're looking at firms. So, uh, so we're we don't have any concerns that we'll be getting somebody that's not been involved in implementation. In fact, there's now quite a body of experience out there from uh, other communities, and that's one of the things that we want to make sure that we um, learn from the successes and mistakes of, of other communities as we uh, attempt to look at ours. The one thing we want to make sure that we do is that we've got a, a good spread, that we've got safe connections between each station, 
uh, and then we've got a system that's uh, financially viable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mike, Joe, have you, what, uh, and, and Christy, welcome. What do you all see as some areas for opportunity and growth and some areas that we may would want to address? Um, I think I think back to some of the earlier things that were said and in, in making connections to the larger system and some of the outlying areas. Um, I live in Nightdale, and right now Nightdale is is connected to the Noose Trail um, over behind one of the subdivisions. Uh, but Nightdale is working on its own greenway that will run through a large portion of the town and eventually the town park. It's fairly close to my neighborhood. Um, there's already a lot of talk just from residents out there that I've been hearing um, from people who are excited to be able to use that to connect to the the greater you know triangle system, um, especially once the Crabtree section comes out and connects to the Noose Trail. Um, I know at that point I'll probably use it as a commuter trail. Um, my path from home to work becomes largely a greenway only. Um, a greenway only commute, except for probably the last mile coming up the uh, kind of treacherous part of Wake Forest Road. But um, the rest of it could be done completely greenway. I've talked to a few neighbors who work in other parts of the city who would have pretty good access um, once that all that connection is made. So I think I think the demand for the greenway system being a commuter system uh, is definitely there. And once a few more connections are made, you'll start to see it a lot more. Um, being able to incorporate that into a lot more, you know, bike-friendly paths on existing roads, uh, I think, I think, definitely makes the system more attractive. But it, we're definitely on the right path. We've got a very good system as it is. I think I've lost audio. No, I hear you. You're fine. Okay, I don't hear anybody else. I hear you. Um, oh, somebody just got muted. I see. That's all I had right now. I'm um, with others on this idea of a need to have people who are not experienced cyclists get comfortable on the roads. And I've been riding with people who are not comfortable at all on streets with traffic, and so the Greenway very much appeals to them. And as I think it was Nathan is that, who was just talking, mentioned if you can figure out how to get, allow them to use greenways and then have comfortable connecting streets to areas where people work, like downtown, North Hills, even Crabtree area, wherever it happens to be, where you can get them there comfortably, you'll start seeing people. Hey, hey Mike. Yes. Mike, sorry, I think we're getting somebody is, uh, Eric? Is somebody listening to uh, YouTube? Is uh, oh, that's um. Mike, can you hear yourself there? I can. It sounds like it's on a loop. You want me to sign back in? No, it's just that's what it's looping. What you had said slowly. I don't know what's happening. This is really odd. So I think we just wait a second. We'll be good. Let me. Uh, I'm gonna drop out and come back in. How about that? Okay. Okay. Huh. This is.
Hey, this is, is are all y'all hearing the same thing? It sounds like it's looping the previous audio. Yeah, I hear it too. All right, let's, let's I'm going to, okay, Mike. Yeah. All right, can, can y'all hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Oh, we're back. We're good. All right. Excellent. Thanks. Um, appreciate y'all's patience. That was that was a uh, technology. Uh, oh no. Oh my gosh. All right. Here, I'm gonna I'm gonna log off and start another one. Sorry. We'll we'll fix this. I'll I'll invite y'all back.